and all of creation. All of creation, all of the earth, make straight a highway, a path for the Lord. Jesus is coming soon.
stand on the promises of Jesus. He is faithful and true. Let's sing us out this morning. There's a place. Yes, there's a place when mercy reigns and never dies. And there's a place where streams of grace flow deep in giving a hand to our praise team this morning. They do a wonderful job leading us in worship every week, and we're just so thankful for them. Welcome to church this morning. I'm Sean Lewis. I'm one of the staff pastors here at Gilead. We just want to thank you for being with us this morning. Hopefully you got a worship guide as you walked in uh, the doors this morning. Right there in the center section of your worship guide will tell you everything that you need to know about what's going on here at church over the next several weeks. If you're a guest with us, we want to thank you for being here as well. We just hope that you fill out that connection card, which can be found right in the pew in front of you at some point during uh, the service. I've got a, just a couple quick house cleaning announcements. Number one, I saw a lot of you grab Operation Christmas Child boxes already. Those are available for you today in the lobby along with uh, 
labels, boy and girl labels, and instructions. If you have any questions about Operation Christmas Child, you can contact me. Uh, my number is right here on the back of the worship guide. You can call the office at any point uh, during the weekend. We're going to collect them just like we did last year. If you have your box done this week, you can bring it next week, and we're going to start stacking them on the stairs as we prepare for uh, National Collection Week, which is on November, the week of November 13th. So after service, make sure you go out to the lobby and grab an Operation Christmas Child box. Also, we are going to have a brief fall festival meeting right after service, just a very brief meeting for all volunteers. If you haven't signed up yet, that's okay. You can come to the meeting if you're interested in helping out. We want to thank you so much for being here. Listen, I know that you have your own sections and you probably shake hands with the same people every week. Let's cross sections this morning and shake someone's hand that you haven't shaked before. Thanks for being here today, church. Well, good morning, church. You know, part of enjoying church is not just what happens up here, but also what happens in the pews and, and the feel and the experience that someone gets while they're sitting there. So I, I want to help everyone have a great time. Why don't you turn to the person next to you and, and just say simply, man, you look like you lost five pounds this week. Go ahead and say that. And uh, all of a sudden, everybody loves church right there. Like, man, I love Gilead. I'm going to come back next week at the church where I look like I lost five pounds. Yeah, okay. So some of you are already planning on eating more this afternoon because I just said that. So enjoy the afternoon. Uh, we are glad that you're here. And uh, we have been going through really getting ready. Uh, this whole fall is getting ready for all the things that we're going to implement starting in January. Uh, and, and so we're going through why the church exists. And the first and foremost reason the church exists is to make Jesus known so people can come into relationship with God. That's the first thing. That, that, that's the, the, the main reason we're here, right, church, is to make God known. And uh, the Bible says, how can people know God unless there's a preacher? And who's the preacher? That's the church. We are the called, and we're to make him known. So we, want, we exist so people can know God. And secondly, once they come into relationship with God, you know, they, getting saved means your eternity is set. You're a child of God forever, and nothing can separate you from the love of God. But there's still a lot of Egypt in our hearts, right? I mean, even though God set the children of Israel free from captivity in Egypt, what they found out in the wilderness was there was still a lot of Egypt in their heart. And so we also, once somebody knows God, we want them to find freedom from the things that enslave us and entrap us in our hearts and in our minds and our experiences from their hurts and pains. We want Jesus and the truth of his word to set them free. Amen? And so once, once they know God, we want them to find freedom. The third reason the church exists is so that we and it's the series that we're beginning today so that people can discover their purpose. There's a reason that God made you. And it's to know him and to find freedom. But then he has gifted you for a specific design and purpose. So we're going to spend a couple weeks finding out why am I here? What is my purpose 
in being here. So let's go before God and ask him to bless our time together in his word today. Please join with me in prayer. Father God, we're, we're glad, we're thrilled, and we're humbled that you have met with us here in our worship as we've lifted up our hearts and minds and sang the truth about who you are and what you've done by dying on the cross and paying for our sins and rising from the dead. And Lord, we are here to worship you, but also, Lord, to allow you to do a work in our life. And Lord, we want to be very different when we walk out than when we came in. Lord, we, we want people today to, to find you, to understand that what they're going through their life is not unique but it's, it's, it's common to all of us in this room and that you are the answer to all those things. But Lord, today we just pray that we would discover, begin discovering our purpose, why we're here, so that it would make sense what you want from our life from this point forward. And so, Lord, speak to our hearts and minds. In Jesus' name we pray. If you pray with me, church, say amen today. Amen. What is great about the Bible is that it gives us the whole plan of God from the beginning to the beginning of eternity. And what the message is from the book of Genesis to the last book of Revelation is that God has a specific plan and design. And the enemy of God, Satan, and the demons that left uh, the fallen angels, they've been trying to keep God from implementing his plan and you know what they just keep failing because God that we believe in is an almighty God and so what his will is and what his plan is is always going to take place and the most exciting thing about our life is being a part of God's overall plan for not only this world but the ages to come for eternity he has a design and a plan that you are a part of, that every single soul that's ever been created, they are a part of God's design and plan, not just for now, but for all eternity. And the great thing about God's plan and design is that he had a plan before the world was formed. So when you look at, in Genesis, in the beginning, first verse of the Bible, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He didn't create it and say, now, what should I do with it? No, he had the plan already. He knew exactly. He created the world and the heavenlies and mankind with a purpose, and des with a purpose already built into the design. He made us for specific reasons. And so for this, I went to our visual department. <laughs> And I got this. It's a, it's a four by four piece of wood. Now, this came from, it's real, it came from a tree. And I hope I don't drop it on my toe. And it, it's pretty heavy. Now, if you look at this, you're like, well, what's the purpose? Well, it depends who's designing it and who has their hands on it. Yes, sir. You see, if, if this is down south at a factory that makes Louisville sluggers, Okay, this is going to become, going to be, the purpose is they're going to put it on a lathe and they're going to spin and this machine's going to chip off this wood and make it skinny on one end and fat on the other. And they're going to put it in the hands of a major league baseball player and they're going to try to use this to knock a little ball over a fence and make millions of dollars in the process. And they, when they get those contracts, they're going to like, I love those Louisville sluggers. They'll never look at trees the same way after they get that $2 million signing bonus. Right. They're going to say, man, I never knew trees were so good to me. Now, if you're a carpenter, you can turn this into, you can cut it into slots and one inches at a time and use a machine and put tongues and grooves on it and turn it into flooring. Same piece of wood. You could also cut it into pieces and make furniture out of it. Or you could make a very beautiful spindle for the end of a table. Or some of you are artsy, and you can use this and, and make art out of it. Like our production team used thrown-away crates 
to make our wall design. That was all just thrown away crates. But they have this, uh, this ability, and, and Gary Bransky just said, yeah, I can do that, and, and he did that. Amen. Even though some people thought that was for trash, but he's like, well, I think we can put a design on it and have a purpose for it. Your life is like, and my life is like this piece of wood. Only God doesn't look at us with guesswork. He's already finished you. He's already made you and completed you with a specific purpose in mind. We're not this piece of wood. God had a plan for you before this world was formed. He knew exactly the role he wanted you to play. He knew how tall you were going to be. He designed what your DNA was going to be like, what your personality was going to be like, what your giftedness was going to be like, what period of time and history you were going to live in, where you were going to live in, what parents he was going to send you to. All of that was predetermined by a sovereign, almighty God. And that's, to, if, I don't know about you, but that's very comforting to me because sometimes I look at the world and I feel a little bit overwhelmed when you start getting numbers thrown at you like seven point how many billions of people on the planet and you say, man, I'm just a block of wood. What am I in 7.3 billion people? Where do I fit in all that? So instead of looking at the world and becoming overwhelmed, instead of looking at the masses, what we need to do is look at God's word and find out that God designed you he didn't just, it's not guesswork. It's, he's not shooting from the hip. He's not deciding as we go. He had a plan for you, and he designed you a specific way so that you can meet the need of that plan that he has for your life. And he wants you to play a very important role in the church with how you've been designed and made. We were destined for a certain purpose. It tells us in Ephesians, the fourth chapter, that there were gifts given to the church, to those that believe in Jesus Christ. And these gifts, Christ, it says in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, now the gifts, these are the gifts that Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility, my responsibility as a pastor, is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. My job is to help you figure out what God designed you for so that you can fulfill your purpose that he had for you before time began. That's my job. So that you can fulfill your purpose and what God made you for. And my job is to reveal that to you through scriptures, my job isn't to do your job. My job is to reveal the task that God has made you for yes, so that you can fulfill what you were designed for. Isn't that interesting? So let's look at the introduction. We are created and saved by God with a specific design for a specific function. Specific design, specific function. It tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the Apostle Paul, once again the writer here, he says, a demonstration of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is given to each person to produce what is beneficial, what is good. Verses 11 and 12, as he goes on with this thought, he says, but one and the same Spirit is active in all of these different gifts, because none are the exact same, Distributing to, ready, underline this in your Bible, each person as he wills. For as the body, the church, is, is one and has many parts, and all the parts of that body, though many, are one body. Amen. So also Amen. is Christ. Yeah. So what he says is, very clearly here, he says, there's, there's a lot of parts that make up the church, the body of Christ. And I, I don't know about you, but I'm glad we don't all look the same. I'm glad we all don't speak the same. I love the different flavors of life, don't you? Yeah. How about if we just decided, okay, 
We don't like people that are different than us. Okay, eat the same thing for the next month. Never deviate. Oh, by the way, eat the same thing and no spices are allowed. No salt, no pepper, nothing, because you know what? You want everything the same. After about three days, your palate's going to be screaming for something different. Why? We don't like the same. We like different. Now, some of you are like, no, I like the same food all the time. Okay, you're weird. That's all right. The rest of us, okay, the rest of us, we like differences. We're not like, oh, good, the same thing again, honey? Yes, that's so great. Let's eat it again tomorrow. And the next day and the next until Jesus comes back. No, we like differences. And so God made the church with all these different flavors and all these different parts. And when all the parts are doing their thing, it comes together like the perfect recipe, and it's beautiful, and the flavor is just perfect. And guess what? The world then takes notice. What do they have that I don't have? Because the whole world is wanting to fit in someplace. The whole world is trying to answer those questions. Why am I here? I mean, really, what is life all about? And they're trying, to, trying their best to go out there and find that purpose. Only we know because we have the inside track. We have the Holy Spirit within us saying, this is your purpose. And this is why God made you. Okay? So what should we do then? Well, since God gave each believer the spiritual gift, we need to do, number one, we need to discover what our gifts are. We need to discover them. If, if we are, like, content to just stay a block of wood, say, what's the purpose? Well, I, I guess you could, you know, like, put it on the floor and, you know, keep something from rolling somewhere, but I, I think God has a better plan for your life. He has a, you, when you put this in the hands of, a, of somebody that knows what they're doing and nobody knows what they're doing more than God, he can make your life into this unbelievable violin that creates music that no one, I mean, just looking at you say, that can't be. But in the hands of the master craftsman, it's amazing what God can bring out of our lives. And so how do you, how do you discover your gifts? Well, it's pretty s- simply this. God has, as soon as you trusted him as your Lord and Savior, this giftedness, this gift of the Spirit was given to every believer. It was, it's not something that we had in the past. It's not something that we were born with physically. It's something that we were born again with. And when you trust Christ as your Savior and the Holy Spirit comes and lives within you, he brings with him this spiritual enablement, the spiritual ability. And a lot of times it takes our natural giftedness and it puts it on another level. Because instead of using it to bring attention to us, we use it to give glory to God. And so your spiritual giftedness or your spiritual gift is really easily found when you look at your life instead of what you think it should be and just look at it, what it really is. For instance, What do you really love to do? Have you ever thought about why you love to do what you love to do? And and when you love to do something, it's not a chore. You'll get up early to do it. You'll stay late doing it. You'll make plans to do it. But why is it that you love to do what you're doing? When you look behind that, at the motivation, there you will find your spiritual giftedness. See, this spiritual gift is like a lens that God has put. Now, I can take off these glasses. Thanks for the glasses, Wendy. Okay. She helped me pick them out. She said, these fit your face. And so whether you agree or not, she thinks so, and she's the expert. And my wife seconded the motion, so it was over. I didn't even have a vote. Okay, but... I, I don't have that bad I, of, of seeing. The doctor said, you know, what this is going to do when I put it on, you just get a little crispier. The lines get clear. When I take them off, I still see you. It's just a tad bit 
fuzzier. But when I put these on, it's like, oh, there you are. Okay, it's not that I didn't see you before, but now I see you, okay, as you really, really, really are. And so this lens, these lenses shape what my brain is understanding. Now think about that. These lenses, if, she, if they put the wrong lenses in, my a little bit fuzzy would be a lot fuzzy, and I wouldn't be accurate at all, would I? No, but these lens color everything that I see. And so a spiritual gift is like God putting a lens in your mind and in your life, and it's like a filter through which you view life. And it, it colors everything in your life. It colors every situation, every circumstance. It colors how you function in your marriage, how you function in your raising of your families. It colors everything. And so the fact that we don't put any, well, not any, but the attention that we should, we're, we're going to spend a couple weeks putting the attention it needs because it really is like putting on a pair of glasses and hopefully within two or three weeks you'll say, I never saw life like this before. Amen. So we need to discover our gifts. Now, how do I do that? Well, the first way you do that is by looking at your gifts and your passions, what you really love to do and what you're gifted to do. There are people that are like, oh, man, it's my passion to sing. And then you say, okay, well, let me hear you. You know, and you're like, hey, okay, that might be your passion, but you're not gifted to do it. Okay? It's not your gift. Okay? Let me, I'll just be true for you. I, I, I listen to a lot of pastors, and, and God bless them. I'm sure they're men of God, but I'm like, how did you become a pastor? Because after five minutes, I want to I, I wanna turn the channel. Because why? I just don't know about their giftedness. Okay? And so you are gifted for something, and usually it pertains to your passions and what other people are telling you, man, you're really good at that. You're really good at that. Listen to what Paul says in Romans chapter 12. And the two paces where Paul really deals with giftedness is 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans 12. So you're going to see these verses a lot in the next few weeks. Romans chapter 12, verse 6 to 8, Paul says this, according to the grace, that's the grace gift, this supernatural enablement, this spiritual gift given to us, we have different gifts. And so he lists seven motivational gifts here. He said, of prophecy, use it according to the standard of one's faith, if service and service of teaching and teaching, if exhorting and exhortation, giving with generosity, leading with diligence, showing mercy with cheerfulness. Now, that doesn't mean that these are the only seven spiritual gifts, but these are main uh, motivators. And you might uh, find yourself in two or three of them, uh, things that you really are passionate about and, and good at. But let's give you, let me give you a scenario and see how this plays out in our life. Let's say that Seven of you, with each one with these motivational gifts, a different one. So seven people rep representing the seven spiritual gifts go and visit a friend in the hospital that's sick. Okay? And, of course, the mercy didn't just go to the hospital. The mercy brought a cake. Because the mercy is em empathetic and they're sympathetic and they're like, oh, I would hate being in the hospital. A cake will cheer them up. So the mercy comes into the room. The other six spiritual gifts are sitting there. They're already in the room, and mercy comes in with a cake and then proceeds to drop it. So mercy drops the cake, and what happens? Well, the leader, the one with the gift of administration, starts immediately assigning duties. Listen, you go get a mop. You do this. You do that. I'll call the nurse. Because why? How, they're looking at a life situation and their spiritual giftedness immediately comes out because they're an administrator, they're a leader, and they start delegating responsibilities. But at the same time, there's the prophet. And the prophet's in the room. The prophet is a truth teller. 
And the truth is standing over there while the administrator's signing rules. Mercy's crying in the corner. And the prophet's going, Kate doesn't belong in a hospital. And here's five reasons why Kate doesn't belong in the hospital. Because why? They're a truth teller. It's not that they're mean. It's not that they're vindictive. It's not that they're... No, that's their spiritual giftedness. And they have to tell the truth just like the leader has to delegate. Just like the mercy had to bring the cake. The prophet had to say, this is why this went bad. And give you five reasons why it's true. But at the same time, you got the giver. And the giver's in the room. And the giver, as soon as the cake fell, the giver is on their phone out in the hallway ordering another cake and putting it on their credit cards. Because why? They have to. They're a giver. They don't think about it. They're not sitting there saying, well, what, what, what should I do in this? The immediate reaction is, I have to give to this situation. And then there's the servant. Before the administrator ever started delegating, the servant's already on their hands and knees cleaning up. No one had to tell them to. Why? They're servant-minded. They're cleaning. They're taking care of what needs to happen. And then there's the teacher. And the teacher is talking about why this went bad and what could be, how it could, when the new cake arrives, how to make it so it doesn't happen again. Because the teacher's teaching. Yes, sir. And then you have the exhorter. That's me. And what's the exhorter doing? Hey, don't cry, mercy. Don't anybody lose their temper. We can turn this thing around and everybody's going to enjoy this visit. Come on, people. We can do this. It can still work out okay. Why? Why do I look at things like that? Because it's the way God made me. I can't help it. I, I never look at it and say, oh, forget it. This is over. I'm leaving. It's like, no, no, we can salvage this. Amen. Why? Because I'm an exhorter. God gave me that gift. It's the lens that I look through everything in life. Now, as I was talking about that, one of those things you were like, oh, that's me. Oh, that's me. Or maybe two of them were like, yeah, I can see me doing that. Oh, yeah, I'd definitely be doing that. <laughs> Why? Because... God gave you a gift. And when life happens, your gifts and your passions come out. Another way to discover your gift is through your life experience. Your life experience. Isn't it interesting that Jesus doesn't call us because of our ability. He calls us and wants us to be available. Amen. Who does God use? He doesn't use you just based upon your ability. He uses people that are available. And that's why in Romans chapter 12, he says it, it is our responsibility to make our life available to God. And he will put the ability in it. Isn't that cool? I am not in charge of putting the ability in. I'm only in charge of making myself available for his use. And that's why he says in Romans 12, 1, Therefore, brothers, by the mercy of God, because we've experienced God's mercy, I urge you, here's action on our part, to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual worship. And so notice what he says. In the living of life, present yourself. So in my marriage, as I'm living out my marriage, he wants me to allow that giftedness to come out. In my work life, he wants that giftedness to come out. In my raising of my kids, in my being a neighbor, let, allow that giftedness to come out and be a sacrifice to the Lord by allowing that to come out. Here's what it says in, a, in the message, and this is not Scripture, but it's a transliteration of the Scripture. And he writes, so here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. As an offering. He wants us in everyday life to let those gifts be known. 
and put them to use for him. And in your life experiences, you will see a pattern. You will see things that happen, and you're like, you know, this keeps happening to me. And God keeps putting me in a situation where, and then all of a sudden your giftedness is needed. Why? He wants you to be available. And he keeps orchestrating circumstances in life so that you can make yourself available. Another way to discover your gifts, not only your passions, what your heart is, what you love to do, and your life experiences, but also, and this is one sometimes we overlook, your pain. What pain have you experienced in life? Because when you experience a pain, a hurt, a trauma, you, for some reason, God burdens us in that very area so that others can be helped going through that same pain, trauma, difficulty. Isn't that true? See, survivors of abuse have a heart for those that are abused. Survivors of drug addiction, of this, of that, you name it, and that typically what our heart and where our passions lie. Because God did something for us in that place, and we want to do something for others in that same place. Don't, don't deny what God has brought you through. I think one of the, the best things you can do as a parent is let your kids know where you failed and how God brought you through. Because a lot of times we only, we only present, I, I remember as a little boy saying this to my mom, saying, man, I, you know, it was, if, it was after a spanking, of course. And say, looking at my mom and dad and going, man, I can't wait till I'm a big person like you and I don't have to, and I don't sin anymore and don't get the spankings. And they just wept. They said, oh, that never stops. It's just the spankings change. And so it's good as parents to let our children know this is where we failed and this is how God delivered us so that they can have that grace in their life too. Here's what Paul says in 2 Corinthians, the first chapter, verses 3 and 4. He says, all praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and God is our merciful Father and the source of all Comfort. He's saying God is a God of all comfort. No matter what pain, what hurt you've been through, God has comfort for you. And once we've experienced that comfort, what happens? He comforts us, verse 4, in all our troubles so that we can say, I'm glad that's over. No, not just that. He comforts us in all our troubles, ready, church, so that we can comfort others that are what? They're going through the same pain that we experienced, the same trauma that we experienced. Who is the best to lead people out of difficulty in life? Someone who's experienced that same difficulty. They know what you're thinking. They know what you're feeling. They they know what exit door you're looking for. They, They know. Why? Been there, done that. But God has given them victory. And so God burdens us for that and says when they are troubled, We will be able, who's we? The ones that have experienced that trouble and God's given us a grace victory over it, then we, then they are troubled, when they are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. So what that means is, here's what the enemy tries to do. God takes you through pain, difficulty in your life, and what do we do? We hide it. Man, I'm never talking about that. I don't want to think about it. It was a horrible thing, and man, squash it. And then God can't use that grace gift to deliver somebody else. The best books that you've ever read outside of Scripture, religious books, Christian books, typically have life stories in them that you relate to, and you're like, oh, yeah, God did it for them. He can do it for me. Right. I mean, Why is this going to be a bestseller? I've really had no trouble in my life, no pain. I've had a pretty wonderful life. 
And I'm going to write a book about it. You want to buy it? You're like, no, my life's nothing like that. Amen, right? My life, there's trouble creeping around every corner. I'm always looking for that Louisville slugger, only it's not in a baseball player's hand. It's, you know, it's in somebody's hand that wants to crack me up over the head. Right? And so through that pain, you can discover your giftedness, what you're passionate about, through your life experiences, through God's giftedness in your life. And, and the thing that makes you tick, if you look at it, you will discover your gifts. And secondly, let's look at your design what does it reveal? It reveals destiny. It reveals what you're here for. The purpose that God wants you to fulfill. David, before DNA, <laughs> before scientific testing, before mapping the genetic map of the human cell, and if you remember, or you don't remember if, unless you're my age, but I mean, scientists, they're, they're on a steep learning curve because when I was, I was a kid in, in school, they said that the one-celled animal was the smallest living organism, and they've since found out they didn't know what they were talking about. That there's tons of things that make up that one-celled animal. And you're like, oh, they, they know it all now. Oh, no. It's just tip of the iceberg. Yes, sir. See, David understood this before there was... DNA testing, before genetic mapping. And listen to what he said in Psalm 139 over 2,000 years ago, verses 13 and 14. He's speaking about God. He said, you made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. He said, man, all those things that even make up our ability to see. I mean, think about it. Your eyeball is just this like jelly thing, right? And yet, look at the beauty that it brings into our mind. And look at its capability to see life. Yeah. And think about our noses and our ears and our taste and our ability to communicate. Yeah. Aren't you glad we don't come to church and I'm going, I'm just going, hoof, 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 hoof. Hoof, hoof, hoof. Hoof, 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 hoof. Hoof, hoof, hoof. Right? No, he gives us the ability to intricately communicate. You know, like all the animals have that. No, they don't. I'm sorry. They don't. Human beings do. We were made in the image of God with the ability to understand right and wrong. He made us as moral beings. That's a wonderful ability to have that innate quality to, you know, that, that, that tingling sense to be like, man, there's something that doesn't smell right about that. Yeah. Exactly. We were on vacation with the little, the girls were little and actually it was... Uh, uh, it, it was all the way, a long ways away. It was in Hawaii. And it was on an island I'd never been to. It was the, the, the big island of where the Kona coast is. And uh, they have active volcano there. And, and, and we went to the big island. We're in the car. We're driving around exploring because it's a big island. Actually, it has the largest cattle ranch in the United States is on that island. Never think about that, but there, we drove through it. It took us like an hour at 60 miles an hour to drive through this one ranch. It's just massive. So we, we went to the state park right on the beach, and I was scouting out places for us to go, you know, shore diving. And so we got to the state park, and there was this weird-looking house right at the edge of the pop property, and, and uh, we were the only ones on the beach except another vehicle. And... Uh, we got out, walked along the beach, and looked at the water, and I was looking at entry points and seeing if it was okay, and, and, and we were walking back to the car, and this gentleman uh, drove up in his car, it was the only other car there, and he said, I, I saw you looking at that house, and I said, yeah, it's weird, it was up off the ground, and it was uh, like an eight-sided house, and I said, yeah, it's weird looking. He goes, you won't believe who built that house, and I said, who? And he said, the country music star, Loretta Lynn. 
If you're familiar with that, I said, yeah, I mean, I grew up, you know, listening to the Grand Old Opry. My parents made me, so, uh, yeah, I, I'm familiar with Loretta Lynn and tall hair, you know, the beehive hair and all that, and Johnny Cash, and I, yeah, I, I, they said, yeah, it's, it's part of the state park now, but, and then he followed it up with this. He said, you want to see something really interesting. And I look at my wife, and we're both thinking the same thing. This is either going to be really cool, or he's an axe murderer, <laughs> and we're going to die in Hawaii. So I'm looking at the guy and sizing him up. Can I take this guy with an axe? What, what, you know, I'm looking at him like that immediately, because, I mean, you don't typically walk up to strangers and want to see them really interesting. We're like, Okay. It's that exhortation lens, see? I'm like, ah, oh, this can't go wrong. And so he says, well, follow me. And we get back on this little driveway and come to the end of the park, and there's a gate, a locked gate. And he gets out of his car and takes the key, unlocks the padlock, and opens the gate. And we look at each other, and we actually verbalize it. Are we going to die here? I don't, I'm not sure. <laughs> We've really had that conversation. I'm like, I think it's going to be all right. And uh, so we, we drive down this long driveway and come up on this home that's on a hill overlooking the ocean, and it's his home. And not only is, does he have a home looking at the ocean, we start listening to his story and say, man, he said, well, I saw you looking at the ocean, and, and I said, well, we're, we're divers, and you know, we're interested in shore diving. And he said, well, you can swim. And I have a freshwater pool right here that I've created. And he was a little bit of a unique fella. He inherited the home from his, when his parents died. He was an electrician. He, was a, he tinkered. He showed me his freshwater water system that he collected off the roof, and he drank it. I mean, just, you know, he was like a, 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 a living alone MacGyver guy. And he wanted to share his giftedness with somebody. And I guess he sized this up and said they would appreciate it. And he goes, now, you see my freshwater pool? And I'm like, there's tropical fish in there. I mean, this was a, like a lagoon. And you could see right to the bottom. And he said, yeah, he said, I caught those fish in the ocean and I, over time, acclimated them to fresh water. And it's true. You can take tropical fish and acclimate them to fresh water. He goes, but if you want to go swimming with them, you've got to make sure you have no sunscreen on because it's very dangerous to them. And I was like, you're going to let me swim in your pool? He said, yeah. So I went to the shower. I'm like, I'm in, man. I'm in. <laughs> I've never seen anything or heard anything like it in my life. I mean, the ocean is right over a bluff from the house, and he's pumping in ocean water, filtering the salt out of it, and keeping this colony of tropical fish alive in this, like about a, a half acre lagoon on his own property. It was like something out of a science fiction book. And we sat there, and he told us his life story, and we told him the story about Jesus. Amen. And he was like, man, I, you know, and, and we figured it was a God moment. But without my lens, see, my wife's a prophet, and she was like, this is not a good idea. <laughs> and it wasn't. And that's the lens she looks through. She looks through that lens like, we could die here. True. I'm an exhorter. I'm looking at it like, man, this is a great opportunity. See? Because why? The lens. The lens. We had an opportunity to sit there and learn a man's life story, at the same time sharing God's story with him. He, we didn't, he didn't come to a decision right there, but the seeds were planted. And on our way out, he was like, if you're going to be here a week, you can come back and visit me. Come back and visit me. Now listen, we are surrounded by people like that. We have just allowed the world to separate us and to divide us and put walls up. And you know what? Your neighbors really do want to share their life with you. 
Your coworkers really do. They're just afraid of somebody condemning them, of judging them, of arguing with them, on fighting them, on hating on them. And it's our job to use our giftedness to break down those walls. Because if we break down those walls, the gospel can get in. But how's the gospel going to get in if we don't tear down the walls? And so God gifts us in order to do that, to break down those walls. He says, your body, you've knit me together in my mother's womb. There's this intricate plan. And the reason I bring that story is up because we were at dinner with the kids the other day, and they said, remember that time when that guy said, you want to see something interesting? They've never forgotten that. Because it was an intricate thing. It was only a God could have us there at the same moment thing. Right? right? Yeah. So he says, thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. So how do we know this complexity of who we are and how God gives us. First of all, we need to discover our gifts. We're going to talk about how to do that in Growth Track in January that we're going to offer every single Sunday afternoon, step one, week one, step two, week two, step three, week three, step four, week four, and we're going to do it every month of the year, every Sunday afternoon. And you, if you go through Growth Track, one of the, one of the sec sections is discovering who you are personality-wise and taking a personality test. Not a pass-fail test. It's a test to reveal how God wired you personally. And then a spiritual gifts test to see how God, the lens that he put in you when you, when you got saved so that you can understand where you fit in glorifying him. Isn't that great? Basically what it is, is you're offering your life up to God and saying, God, show me what you want out of this. You want a table spindle? You want a baseball bat? You want flooring? I don't care. I'm presenting my life. You show me. You show me. And then I will, if it's hitting baseballs, I'll hit them to the glory of God. If it's holding the table up, I will hold it up to the glory of God. Of course, that's a piece of wood. Yours is always going to impact people. Yes, sir. Always impacting people because Jesus died to save people. Amen? Yes. And so then, once you discover it, we're going to show you how to develop your gift, how to hone your skills in exercising that gift. Instead of just saying, oh, that's who I am. We want to hone it. We want to sharpen it for God's use. And then we put it to use. We apply it in our interactions with other people. Now, how, do you, how do you do that? Man, every single person you're going to run across needs someone that cares for them, mercy. Needs someone that will lift them up, exhorter. Needs someone that will tell them a truth, a prophet. Needs someone that will tell them what to stay away from and where to go, a teacher. And why things are how they are, a teacher. Needs someone to kind of show them this. These are the steps of life, an administrator. Okay? Need to pour into their life the grace of God. That's a giver. Every single person you run across needs the giftedness of the church pouring into their life. They need us. And the world is suffering without us because God gifted us to make him known to them. Yeah, he did. And you have a role to play in this. So the conclusion today is our purpose is to serve God by serving others. And well, I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait until January and begin doing that. No, no, no. Don't wait till January. Begin today. Look for an opportunity and serve people in your passion, your life experience, and your pain and start doing it today. Start doing it right now today. But let me tell you, if you don't know God, this doesn't work for you. You have to first come into relationship with Jesus. He died on the cross so you could know him. 
That's what he did for you. That's how much he cares for you. He gave his life and took your sin upon him and paid for it all completely. Now, all you have to do is call upon him and surrender your life to him. You will become his child. He will give you a spiritual gift, and you can start making a difference in this world for his name. But first, you have to know him. You have to know him. But there's many of you that you know him. You've been Christian for a long time, but we have that crusty disease. Say so what? We're, we're crusted over Christians. We've heard it all, we've seen it all, we've done it all, and we're not useful at all because we just look at everything negatively. It'll never work. We think our spiritual gift is to be Eeyore. Well, let me tell you, Eeyore is not listed in the spiritual gift list. It's not because Eeyore never benefited anybody. Could you see Jesus looking at his disciples and saying, you guys will never measure up. No. Nope. That never came out of his mouth. Was it true? Kind of. I mean, remember when he died on the cross, they all ran. Yes, sir. They all ran. They weren't much, just like us. But boy, when he rose from the dead, they surrendered their life. They became available to God, and they changed the world. Yeah, they changed the world. So what that means is that some of us Christians in here today, we need to put on the lens of availability because you've been unavailable for some time, and you need to present yourself available again so God can use you in a mighty way. Let's bow our heads, close our eyes right where you're set. With your heads bowed, eyes closed, if you need to pray right now and, and surrender your life to Christ and ask him for forgiveness, now's the time to do that. Right where you sit, it's a perfect opportunity for you to do that. I'm going to lead you in a prayer, and the prayer doesn't save you, but your heart and tension combined with the prayer will. But if you're already a believer, I'm going to also pray for you that we would surrender our life so that we can bring glory to God in this place. Because it's not about us, it's about Him. And He has made us to bless others in His name. So if you feel out of the loop on that, your first step is to make yourself available again. And you can do that right there where you said, let's pray together. Father God, we're so grateful that you're here with us. We're grateful for what you did on the cross to take our pain, take our suffering, and to pay our judgment, thus creating a way for sinners to be made right with a holy God. And Lord, there's people in this room today, right now, and they're surrendering their life to you. And may they ask for forgiveness, ask for you to come in to their life and make them a new person. Lord, there's many of us who have been believers and we've known you for so many years. We've become a little stale. And we want to anew present ourselves available to you today. And so, Lord, that's what we do. Take our life and take the gifts that you poured into it and use them for your glory and your honor to make a difference in this world. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. With heads bowed and eyes closed, if you prayed with me today, either prayer, you slip your hands up, please, to the Lord and say, Lord, I meant it. I meant it with all that I am. Upstairs, you're included in this too. Amen and amen. Great. Now you can go ahead and look up. Thanks for being such great list. I, isn't it exciting to know that God has a plan for each one of us? Amen? That's very exciting. And so the next couple weeks, we're going to talk more in depth about how this goes. Right now, we're going to worship the Lord and our tithes and offerings. If you're a guest, please do not feel compelled to give. These are for the regular members and attenders, people who call Gilead Baptist Church home. If you look in your bulletin on our, on our, on our budget, we're a little bit behind. And so I'd like to ask you to do something today. 
And for the next, you know, last year, we were the same amount behind at this time. And then in December, we took special offerings and, and we almost got caught completely up. And I would like you to just agree with me today to the next couple weeks to give a little extra and get that decline and bring it back up to par so that we won't have to be talking about that in December because in December we're going to be doing the Christmas party and blessing families with that. We're going to be doing the fall festival at the end of this month. The Christmas boxes that are going to go around the world to reach people for Christ. Your generosity is putting the gospel all over the place. Amen? And so we just want to continue that process. And, and if you've gotten a little behind in that, we ask you to catch up. I know Cindy and I are going to give extra uh, until that gets rectified. And so I hope you join with us. Ushers, why don't you come at this time and uh, give as God has graciously given to you. Amen, church? Amen. Thank you so much. <laughs>